Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine. That's me. Uh, so this is episode 13, uh, Shutting Down the Topanga Dice Studio. Um, there, there may have been some stuff on Instagram around this time. I was uh, in the actually in it, doing it. Um, but these are a couple clips of just the, the, the last final moments that uh, we were there. And uh, I was packing everything in our car. Um, we ended up driving all the way back from California to Vermont. Uh, it's quite an adventure. Um, but uh, before we dive into that, um, I'm, I'm going to just try and keep this conversational stuff going. Um, there's just been so many cool uh, comments and questions and stuff about um, what's what's been up there. It seems like the uh, all the gear-related posts seem to uh, inspire the most um, comments and questions. Um, and so still, still talking about this RCA thing and stuff related to it, this RCA console. So, uh, I'm going to go through a couple of those and some of these comments, questions, things may be a little bit out of order because, um, uh, I'm sure you've probably noticed that I record the commentary for these video clips. Um, I'll, I do bunches of them at a time when I have time to sit down and do it. Um, I'll do like four episodes in a batch. And so some of this is going to be a little bit out of order as far as the, um, the comments and question stuff. Um, so the episode, uh, yeah, there's going to be one that goes up before you see this, that is going to be uh, addressing questions that were further back, but I, I don't know. Hopefully it all makes sense. If you're, if you're watching all of these, then it will make sense. I think, I don't know if you're jumping in, I don't know what to tell you. Good, good luck. Um, but here we go. So this is more, uh, stuff with the, with the RCA console and other things in and around it. Um, so somebody asked, uh, you know, said more questions. Did Jurgen Strauss come to Vermont to help on acoustics? Um, I know he is very caring of where his speakers go. That is very, very true. Um, sending pairs to most retailers because they don't... Oh, refusing to send pairs to most retailers because they don't have a decent room. Um, curious if he helped in person or just advised uh, for, for a direction. So um, Jurgen has not come here, but um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to like do uh, have Zoom uh, calls with him. And I've sent him all the dimensions, showed him all the design details and stuff. And he applied all of his amazing knowledge and uh, resources. He has, you know, some supercomputers that he uses for calculating room acoustics and all this stuff and uh, gave me a bunch of amazing guidance on this. And even after I got into the whole Helmholtz uh, resonator thing, at a certain point, I was like, okay, you know, I just, I emailed him. I was like, okay, Jürgen, I, we, <laughs> you got to help me with these Helmholtz things. I, I don't know. I was just driving me nuts. And so uh, I was able to get on with him again and uh, talk to him about that a little bit more. And it was very helpful. Um, I found out that I was not actually crazy, uh, that they are very complicated. Um, and there's a certain point where it, it it's, the math starts to fall apart um, when you're calculating the resonance of a Helmholtz resonator. There's this thing called the um, the port end correction, and that's the part where it falls apart. Um, you know, I did a lot of research about it, tried to find some numbers for that, and none of them really made sense. the 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 only place where it did was uh, I would I came up with my own end correction. Uh, value based on a result I was getting. And then when I started moving the numbers around and continued to use that end correction value, it, it translated to other, you know, dimensions. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about that more in a second. But uh, so yeah, you're going to not come here, but he's given me tons of incredible help and uh, guidance on this. And, um, <coughs> um, and so so yeah, um, uh, you know, hopefully it will ultimately end up, you know, in a place that he's, that he's excited about. Uh, I hope to have him come eventually and hear the speakers in the space. I mean, for me already, just hearing those speakers in this space, like I already said, it is fucking incredible. Um, totally. I've never experienced anything like it. Uh, okay. So, uh, cool comment. I thought I would highlight, highlight this because it's so true. And I think, you know, 
uh, it's easy to miss how often the harmonic series shows up in the world of music and acoustics. Um, but uh, somebody commented, so harmonic distortion could be likened to the pole bars on a Hammond B3. That is exactly <laughs> what the pole bars on a Hammond B3 is. You know, it is the harmonic series. Um, so yeah, cool observation there. Uh, let's see, somebody, a couple of people asked this, uh, would you consider making your own RCA inspired console unit channel strip as an undertone product in the future? I am definitely seriously considering that. I just think there should be more of this out in the world. Um, we're definitely talking about it. We have some uh, projects that we're still finalizing now. Um, I think you know, most of this has already been announced, but uh, uh, so 500 series EQ. I mean, the very f finishing stages of, of that, um, we had some at uh, the AES convention in New York. Um, there's some final tweaks that are being done that I'm still listening to and considering this on this one, I'm actually seeking some other input because I think my taste is starting to travel into a place that may not really, <laughs> uh, be suitable for the rest of the universe. Um, I'm just, I'm going off into my own weird world here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we're finishing that stuff up. Um, uh, we also, there's a new compressor design that, uh, Larry and I are working on that I'm super excited about. So once we get all of that stuff, um, you know, out of the design phase, then I'm going to seriously look at, uh, this RCA circuitry. Um, there's, there's a very specific version of it that I think would be amazing to have, um, where uh, you could use, you know, have it available to use basically the way I use it. Uh, and so a unit that has this um, this summing amp um, as well as a mic preamp and then maybe a unit that's just mic preamps. So you can have a bunch of mic preamps, maybe you have a couple of units that have the, the summing amp in them, or maybe that's its own standalone stereo thing or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. But um, uh, man, uh, it's just... It, it, it's just a beautiful sound. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're definitely considering that. Okay. Um, another comment about the Dante thing, um, that, uh, you know, one millisecond, that's equivalent of standing another foot farther away. Um, that that's true, you know, like a millisecond matters, uh, in the world of audio. I, I agree with that. And, um, if you're, if you're using Dante, uh, I think you would want everything to go Dante. Because if you're doing a combination, like, you know, what I have in my place right now, there's um, these Cat6 mic tie lines, and maybe I'll use those. I have a bunch of Ogami tie lines. If I have a Dante thing, and I have one mic going through Dante and one mic going through um, just a conventional mic tie line, then that one millisecond will really change um, how they relate to each other, especially like if it's mics on a drum kit, you know, um, one millisecond, that can that essentially changes the relationship of where your snare drum and overheads are placed uh, to each other. Uh, and it can mean the difference of your snare drum being out of phase, you know, with the overhead. So it matters. Um, then, okay, there's a whole long question here about um, advice about what equipment to buy. And uh, this is a guy named Ryan Reedy. And I, I apologize. I've I, I read through this. I definitely read everything. And I would love to be helpful on this. But I have no experience with this equipment. I've never used it. And, uh, and so I just don't feel confident about making a recommendation here. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish you all the best of luck with it. Um, I just, uh, yeah, it's a, I just don't know enough about the equipment, what you might get out of it, how you're using it. There's so many things that would really, I think be important to know about, uh, making that decision. So, and it's a, uh, it's an important one. Okay. Uh, talking to, let's see, uh, check out, okay, uh, Kush Audio Omega 458. I love, uh, Kush stuff. The plugins are really incredible. Um, you know, uh, most in, in particular, that AR1 compressor is the best tube, um, you know, compressor plugin emulation I've heard. It, I, I think it is truly, truly exceptional. Um, use that thing all the time. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. This is, I can clarify this. So I'm confused. Did you take that console to Nashville for the recording? Is it what you're referring to with the, in, in the setup that I had, my preamps were coming in, I would capture those directly on the computer. Yes, that is exactly right. So, um, I did take the RCA console to RCA studio, a Nashville. Um, I've just, I felt like that would be somewhat poetic, uh, in a certain way. I mean, that, studio, as I understand it, was built and operational probably in the early 50s. So there was 
um, something similar to this console was probably in there when they first opened that studio, and it was just cool to have it back in there. And you know, I love it. I'm recording everything through it, so I definitely brought it. Um, you know, it's more transportable than a lot of other consoles. You know, it's probably 120 pounds, something like that. So uh, it's best to you know two people can pick it up and you can just throw it in a car and take it wherever you want to go. Um, and so I did take it there and, you know, everything, uh, I've, uh, it sounds like a couple people have, um, checked out this Nickel Creek record. There's now actually two songs that are up on, um, on Spotify that you can check out. So those recordings are a beautiful representation of the RCA console, um, really being the centerpiece of the recording. So yes, so those six mic preamps captured all the primary stuff. Um, and, uh, and then ultimately when it was mixed, the the final stereo mix bus went through the summing amps uh in the rca console so yeah it went to nashville came back here i've been using it on everything okay um and then here's another question about uh using uh ribbon mics running very long distances do you think uh, cloud lifters uh are are uh, beneficial for that um i i got a bunch of these cloud lift type things and um and I've been using them for some stuff. And uh, here's a, a couple thoughts about it. I, I have not had huge problems with um, running long distances with ribbon mics. A couple people have asked this, so I guess that's um, a common notion out there that there's something you know that could be an issue with that. Um, the only thing I can think of is that <coughs> uh, because of the low output level, from the microphones, you do generally need a lot of gain at the other, other end of that run. Longer runs could be more susceptible to picking up hum and other kind of interference. So may, maybe that's the issue there. Um, uh, the capacity of, this, uh, of the cable could start becoming an issue. You know, um, typically those things, you know, have a transformer output, transformer balance output on them. And uh, the capacity of the cable could interact with the transformer in the microphone. Maybe that's an issue there hasn't really been a problem for me. Um, uh, but I did try these cloud lifter things. There was, um, because, uh, I, I think I mentioned this before, but right now, what I'm doing on just about everything is it's just like all ribbon mics into this RCA console. Um, and, and so, uh, there are times where, you know, especially on Nickel Creek, you know, people are playing really, really soft sometimes. And I need a huge amount of gain. The, the RCA console maxes out at about 40 dB of gain. That's that's what you get. Um, and it's pretty much that all the time. You can add a pad to the front of it, but um, there's really no way of adjusting the amount of gain. It's always just 40 dB, and then you can pad or not in front of it. Um, and so, uh, um, so, yeah, so there were times when they were playing really, really soft or I had a mic a little further away where I needed more gain. I tried these cloud lifter things, they did not like being plugged into the RCA console <laughs> at all. Um, they really didn't like it. Uh, everything, it just, you know, and I was able to measure it. It just rolled off all of the high end and I couldn't actually figure out exactly what was causing it. Um, and I even got Larry involved on this one because I really needed to use something like this. And, um, and so what, um, I, we tried everything. I tried, uh, we were, there was some issue with the input transfer, and I apologize, I can't remember the details of it. It didn't end up being the answer anyway, so it doesn't matter. But um, I tried all kinds of stuff with the grounding of the input transfer and all these things that we thought might be doing it because the input impedance should not have been a problem. But there was some weird eccentric thing about the input of those mic preamps that caused a complete roll off of the high end with the cloud lifters. Um, so those didn't work. Um, the thing that did work is I was able to use an MPDI-4 um, to do a huge amount of gain first, and then the output of the MPDI-4 could get plugged into the mic input um, on the RCA console. Um, I used a pad there to get the impedances so they'd be a little bit happier. But um, 
you know, and the, the MP, MPDI fours is, is pretty, uh, indestructible. Like that thing, you can plug it into anything. That's what, what I love about Larry's circuit design as far as like the balancing and all of that stuff. Like those circuits are just, they're so robust, man. You can plug them anywhere, any way, um, plug it in completely wrong, plug it into itself, like whatever. And you, you won't blow it up and it'll always be happy. However you connect that thing to, to whatever. Um, and so when I really need something to just work, <laughs> I always, I always go to the undertone breeze. Uh, and so in this case, what I realized, I initially tried it just plugging the output directly into it. And, um, it was too noisy, which makes sense because at that point there was way, way too much gain. And I realized that I could pad down the output of the MPDI four and that would pad be padding down whatever amplifier noise was being added by that active circuitry. And so it, it dropped the noise floor massively, you know, so you're dropping the noise floor. I, I forget what the pad was that I used. I think it was like a 35 dB pad. Drops the noise floor down uh, another 35 dB, you know, so the, the, the noise floor in that thing is way, way, way down there. I, I forget what, you know, it's like minus 150 at that point. And, and so that worked amazing. And so I could add a huge amount of gain, um, on the, uh, on the MPDI four and sort of pick and choose how much I wanted to pad after it. And then, um, you know, and the, the RCA pre was always preset at 40 DB and I was able to get, you know, all the gain I would ever need, um, to make sure that I got healthy signals coming in. I'm hitting those RCA preamps kind of in the sweet spot of their, um, of their dynamic range. Uh, so you get the full sort of musicality of, of what they're doing. Um, and that was sort of a, a, a very important innovation, uh, in the, in the process of working on the, the Nickel Creek record. So it actually ended up being, you know, like instruments or vocal mics into MPDI fours and then out of those into the RCA console. There were times when I didn't need the extra gain. And so I just bypass it, uh, and have it go straight into the RCA. But, um, anytime we needed that extra gain, it, it worked amazing, uh, for that. Um, uh, so yeah, but cloud lifters didn't work at all. Um, okay. Uh, somebody insisting on having the intro music, whether it's an official episode or not, I will try and incorporate that. Um, so there you are. There's, uh, the, the recent batch of comments and questions and stuff. I'm going to just try and keep, keep the conversation going as we roll through this stuff. So now on to this episode. Um, so again, this is about uh, shutting down the Topanga Nice uh, studio. So here are the clips. This is kind of a short thing. You can check it out. Here it is, the sort of sentimental moment of closing the Topanga studio. Check it out. Hey, everybody. Just a quick update. Uh, this is might be interesting. It is the end of an era, another era. Uh, check this out. <laughs> this is what used to be. Topanga Nice Studio. <laughs> it is done. This this room's done as well. And so, yeah, there's my old Strauss monitors, and I still gotta get the guitar hangers off. Um, here's the uh, here's all of the stuff that was still in Topanga Nice Studio, and uh, so that's all gonna go to Vermont now, and. So Vermont, it's just going to be the, uh, that's going to be the place, um, for making, making records for me. Uh, so this is all going to go in a moving truck that's shown up today. And then I have a few key items that, you know, uh, are going to ride in the car with us. Of course, my, my new baby, the, uh, the RCA console and some outboard stuff, whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just... I just finished mixing a whole album in a week. It was insane. I had to mix like, you know, two or three songs a day. And uh, I actually, I actually pulled it off. Um, I used to, I used to mix one song in two to three days. <laughs> and so this was, this is uh, a return to my earlier years of having to work very fast. And I, I think I pulled it off. You know, we'll see. I think it was, you know, it was good for me to have to, try and approach it that way but um hopefully it was good for the record well i guess we'll see um 
but uh, but that's what's happening. Um, we're I'm done with that part of things. We're, we got to drive ourselves across the country back to Vermont, and um, I'll get settled back in there, and then then I'll really be able to uh, dive back into some making record stuff. So I will see you then, and. Uh, Hopefully all this makes it there safe and sound. All right, I hope you're all well, bye. Oh my okay. God, look at that. Here we are. That was Andy Cunningham behind us, by the way. He was waving. Oh, no kidding, <laughs> wow. Here we are. The winter wonderland. Hi. Oh my God. That Daddy, look hot. at the little solar lanterns are still going. Oh, look at them. <laughs> Should I pull around the front like this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, do it. Oh my god, they're doing so good. We might get stuck, but it's okay. Okay, we're home. Oh, yeah. I don't really need to go anywhere. Oh. <gasps> So there it is. Um, you know, there was, uh, it, you know, that uh, at one point I was feeling like it would make sense to keep that set up, but ultimately, um, you know, uh, it made more sense to just turn it over and just have all of the, all of the, my important equipment out here in Vermont. This is really going to be sort of like the center of my recording universe now. Um, it looks like now, actually more recently, we may actually be sort of splitting time between the two. And so I'll probably, when I'm out there, I'll probably bring a much more modest um, portable setup uh, to, to use in that room because it is all the acoustic treatment is still in there. And so I, all I have to do is put up some speakers, you know, bring a little portable rig with me and I'll still be able to tinker around in there. Um, and then, yeah, I talk about uh, mixing a, a record in a very, very short amount of time. Um, and uh, those mixes were very close. I ended up revisiting them uh, a little bit more when I got back here. So I ended up, um, when I, while we were gone on this whole journey of like going to Nashville um, to record a, a whole record and then going to, um, uh, to Topanga and did all the overdubs for that record and then mixing that record, while I was gone, um, the large Strauss monitor showed up. And so when we got back, I was, I was just dying to set those up. So I actually set them up, um, in my basement and, uh, of the house because the studio was still total construction zone, like way too dirty and crazy, uh, to put those speakers over there and it's yeah, noisy. There's no, yeah, it was, it wasn't ready. So, um, so I set them up, uh, in the basement and there's a video coming up, uh, you know, an episode coming up where you'll, you'll see that setup. Um, me trying to make this, whoa boy, uh, talk about <laughs> an untreated acoustic environment. Oh my God, this basement was not easy to deal with. Um, so I, I had to like, you know, bring every tube trap I could scrape together into this room and try and make it listenable in there. Um, and it, it was a little tough, you know, it was... It was uh, a challenging first listen for, for Jurgen's amazing speakers. Um, they still sounded really incredible in there, but boy, there was, there was a lot of, a lot of weirdness in the low end. Um, and so I did a little bit more work on those mixes then. Um, and then there was one, one more round where I recalled just a, a few more things. So those, the mixes that I finished in Topanga ended up not being the final, final thing. Um, I'd say, you know, 90% of, of the work that was done there still ended up being sort of the, the heart of the mixes. And, um, and it was me just making just fine, you know, final tweak adjustments, uh, on stuff. Um, the last final adjustments I did were back up in this room after the basement experience. There's also other things in the basement that were a little weird. It's, um, I was set up down in our basement next to where this, um, you know, boiler is. And so every, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, this thing would turn on like a jet engine. So, I, you know, I, I, I got, <laughs> that sort of wore me out a little bit. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to be in there anymore. Uh, so I set up back here, back uh, in this space, um, which I was a little more familiar with and uh, was able to make the, the last final tweaks on a handful of mixes, maybe just four or five of them. And now that one, that one's totally done. That one has not been announced yet. So I still can't say what it is. 
Um, uh, it's going to get announced soon. I'm, I'm very excited to talk about that one. Um, uh, and then, you know, you see after a long drive across the entire country, um, we had an insane drive uh, back um, across the country. I'm trying to think. Yeah. So on this one, did we have our trailer? I think we did. Yeah. I think we were still towing the trailer at this point. Um, and so we have this little Nobo trailer. Uh, it wasn't quite as loaded down because I, we, there was a rental truck that took a, a, all the bulk of the stuff. And then we could sort of, you know, scale down what we added, had to put in the car and in the trailer. Um, and, um, uh, the trailer we took to Vermont, uh, to Nashville, um, with all the recording equipment that I used for, uh, recording at the RCA studio. And, uh, it was super close. We had one super, super scary moment with the tra trailer, uh, towing it with a, a Volkswagen Atlas where, um, just got going a little, a little too fast. There's hills going up and down, coming down a hill. And it's amazing how it happens just out of nowhere. You're just sm smooth sailing. And all of a sudden that thing starts to fishtail. And, um, it got so intense that you could hear the, the wheels skidding in each direction. We came as close as you can get to flipping a car or trailer without actually doing it. <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was completely terrifying. You know, it was me and Grace and, and Sagan in the car, you know, Sagan was strapped in like a fighter pilot in his car seat. So he'd probably be fine. But, uh, you know, that, that was completely horrifying. Imme immediately after that, we got to Nashville. We, uh, I installed uh, sway bars on there, you know, to, um, get the thing to be a lot more stable. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so then we drove that whole rig all the way back, um, uh, to, to Vermont and I'm trying to remember what happened along the way there, but it was just a long drive and you see the moment where we finally arrive in Vermont in the winter and it's uh, a winter wonderland and we were all just happy to be home. So, um, so there it is just another moment along the way and this crazy endless transition, I think. The, uh, the transition is finally going to be wrapping up soon where I can finally go like, okay, we, this, this thing that we started talking about almost three years ago is, is done now. <laughs> we, we did it. Now we're here in this new reality and we can just move forward in our new reality. So, um, we're almost there, but, uh, still a little more work to do. More, more moving stuff. God, endless moving stuff around. Okay. All right. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.